Welcome to our midweek talk and we're starting a new series in the book of Nehemiah on the title Building for God's Glory. So let's read Nehemiah chapter 1 together. The words of Nehemiah the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year I was in Suda the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with a certain men from Judah. And I asked him concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who have survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gate, gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept, and mourned for days, and continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love of those who love him and keep his co- commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you. And have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost part of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Amen. Now as we look at this chapter uh, today we're going to do so under the title Burdened to Pray and the first thing we need to do is set the scene, the background of what is happening here, the historical and biblical background for the book of Nehemiah. Now remember the reign of King David, 40 year reign, happened around the year 1000 BC, so a thousand years before the birth of Christ. And then 40 years after David's death, the kingdom of Israel split in two. This was during the reign of Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And so 10 of the tribes followed Jeroboam and formed the northern kingdom of Israel. And only two tribes remained faithful to the family line of David, Judah and Benjamin. And they were based around Jerusalem. 200 years after that division, in 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel is taken into captivity by Assyria. The northern kingdom was always much more evil and sinful. So they are taken away by the Assyrians, based in uh, Nineveh, was their capital city. And then in 606 BC, which hundred another about 120 years, Jerusalem is defeated by the Babylonians and there are three waves of deportations from the people of Judah to Babylon. Babylon being modern day Iraq in 606, 597 and 587 BC. So over a period of about 20 years, people are taken away in different waves. The first wave was the royal people, included Daniel. The second wave were the uh, artisans, the craftsmen, included Ezekiel. And then the third wave, everyone else was taken and Jerusalem, including the temple, was destroyed. So that was 587 BC that finished up. And so about 70 years later, then the time came for the children of Israel to return. And the first return, again, there are three waves of deportation. There are three waves of return. The first return was under Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was of the the line of David, of that royal line, he would be an ancestor of the Lord Jesus. He would be a rightful king. So he led the people back, about 50,000 people, only 50,000 
Hundreds of thousands were taken into captivity, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, but only a very small proportion returned. And over the next 20 years or so after his return, that indeed the temple in Jerusalem was built under the prophecies of Zechariah and Haggai to encourage the people. So it took about 20 years and indeed the temple was rebuilt in Jerusalem. And then about 80 years after Zerubbabel's return, Ezra returns. Now this is a very small return. There's only about 1,800 people, mostly Levites and priests. And they come to rebuild the spiritual life of the of the city and the area. And so that happened under Ezra. And then 13 years after that, so 93 years from the first return under Zerubbabel, 13 years after the second return, we have the time of Nehemiah that we come to here in Nehemiah chapter 1. So as we come to Nehemiah, uh, let's see Nehemiah's burden, first of all, in verses 1 to 4. Nehemiah is described in this chapter as a cupbearer of the king. He was serving King Artaxerxes. He was serving at Susa, which was the winter palace. What we have here is called the month of Chislev, November, December time. And so here we have Nehemiah in a very comfortable position, a cupbearer. wasn't just a butler. He was a someone who was a confidant too for the king. So he was in a very important position. Now, the report from the Jews who had come back from Jerusalem to where he was in Susa. Susa would have been in modern day Iran. And the report that came back was that things were not good. Look there at verse 3. It says, And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who has survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroy, destroyed by fire. So the situation isn't good, yes, the temple's been rebuilt, but the city walls are still a mass of rubble. These are people very exposed to attack. The, the city's still in a real mess. What is Nehemiah's response? Verse 4, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And although Nehemiah was in a very comfortable situation in Susa, he was greatly disturbed by what he had heard of what was going on among God's people back in Jerusalem. And so it says here, he sat down, he wept, he mourned for days. He was greatly troubled by the situation. Now, we need to realise there were a lot of other Jews who were not so concerned. In Babylon, it wasn't like when they were in captivity in Egypt. In Babylon... They weren't slaves. They were allowed to exercise business and trade and they had a very comfortable life. And so there were only a small portion of the people who had returned. Most of them stayed in Babylon. And of those who stayed in Babylon, most of them weren't concerned about what was going on. But Nehemiah was concerned. And, you know, we need to ask ourselves, are we concerned about the state of the church? We have a church today of declining numbers. That's right across the Presbyterian church. It's Christianity and this country is declining. In our church in Brookside, we have relatively small numbers of primary school age children in our Sunday school, small numbers like in our anchor boys. And so our numbers are declining. Our numbers are going down. You look around us, we live in a community where there are so many children, so many families, so many people who have no time for the things of God. Think of the immorality that's all around and the breakdown of family life. There's so much to mourn. Do we mourn at the spiritual state of our church, our community, our country in these days? Or are we like most of the people who were in Babylon or in Persia at that time who were far too comfortable to be concerned? Look what Nehemiah he sat down, he wept and mourned for days. He continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Christian, you need to be disturbed by the state of the church today, which is in decline. You need to be disturbed by the, the godlessness of society around us. You need to be troubled by this. Nehemiah's burden. We need to be burdened for the state of the world around us. 
And then we have thirdly here Nehemiah's prayer in verses 5 to 11. Now Nehemiah prayed for many days, so he prayed many words. So this must be just a summary that indeed is given of what he prayed. To give us an example of what he prayed. But like the Lord's prayer, so like a, it's to be like to, to a template to show us what's important in prayer. There's a lot to learn. This is one of the greatest prayers of the Bible. There's a lot for us to learn from it. And I've, I've got here with seven points to take from it. First of all, it's to the awesome God. Look at verse seven, 5, sorry. O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God. He wasn't praying to a wee, weak God. He's a God of heaven. He's a God who's awesome. He's a God who before him, Nehemiah bows with reverence. This is a great God. This is a big God. This God is much greater than the problems that Nehemiah is confronted with. We need to realise too that we're praying to a God who's much greater than any problems we face. To the awesome God. Secondly, to the covenant-keeping God. Look there in verse 5 again. He says, O awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love of those who love him and keep his commandments. He's a God of covenant commitment. He commits himself to his people. He loves his people. He's devoted to his people. And he wants his people in return to be committed to him. But he's a God who's faithful to his promises. He's God who's faithful to his people. And you remember when we think of covenant, Jesus took the wine in the upper room and says this, is the new covenant in my blood. How committed is God to his people? Look at the cross. Look at Jesus' shed blood. That's the commitment of God. So he's the awesome God. He's a covenant God. He's a God we can trust as we pray. Thirdly, it's expectant prayer in verse 6. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant. This was not just a matter of going through the motions by Nehemiah. He prayed really expecting that God would listen. He prayed expecting that God would hear. He's expecting that God would act. In my younger days, there was a, I remember there was a wee drama that sometimes was used in youth meetings. And so it's someone saying the Lord's Prayer. And as they said the Lord's Prayer, there's like a, a voice on their back. It was as if God was answering them back. And they were getting quite annoyed. This they they just wanted to pray the prayer. They didn't expect that God would answer. And in many ways, that can be our prayer. We just want to pray the words, and we have little expectation that God hears. Oh, let's pray with expectation. Fourthly, it's a confessing prayer. In verse six, Nehemiah confesses the sin of his people. He identifies with the sin of his people. Many of the things and following idols and, and so forth, he had not been guilty of, but he knew his own heart. He knew he wasn't sinless. And so before he would just point the finger out there, he looked in there. And we need to be like that as well. We need to be confessing before the Lord, not putting on a sham, not putting on a show. Be honest with our sin. Let God's word reveal our sin. Confess it to the Lord. Fifthly, he was pleading the promises in verse 8 to 9. He speaks about how from the book of the likes of Exodus and Deuteronomy, how God it says when his people would be scattered, he would bring them back when they would seek him again. And so he's pleading the promises of God. When God promises to do something, God is binding himself in. But also, you remember God had brought some of the people back already, 50,000 under Zerubbabel. 1800 under Ezra. What Nehemiah is wanting is to be part of this, this promise to bring the people back. He said, Lord, I want to be part of your great plan. And so in our Christian lives, we should be seeking to be, how can we part of great, God's great plan? God's great plan of salvation for people. God's great plan of building the church. God's people, great plan of redeeming people. God's great plan of glorifying his name. How do we fit into God's plan? We need to ask that important question. Sixth thing is, point F is redemptive prayer. Look how he prays in verse 10. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. 
He's been saying, Lord, look what you've done in the past. Look how you've rescued your people by your power in the past. You're this great God. Surely you've redeemed your people. Not that we would stay in a state of shame. It was shameful, the state of things around Jerusalem. It was dishonouring to God's people. It was dishonouring to the Lord. And he's praying because this is a God of salvation who wants to bless his people. Paul in Romans 8 and 32 speaks of how the, if God gave his son, is there any good gift he would withhold from his people? This is God who redeems his people. He loves to bless his people. And the final point, it was hopeful prayer. Verse 11 is quite similar to verse 6. He says there in verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give your success to your servant today. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He's about to go into the king and to seek the king's help. But Nehemiah is looking to the future of hope, with hope because in his time of prayer, he is just engrossed in this God. He's aware of the power, the majesty, the love of this God. And so he is praying to the one who can make all the difference. Nehemiah was going to engage in a great work for the Lord. And he begins by immersing that work in prayer. And you know, if we want to do a great work of the Lord, if we want to see our churches built, if we want to see the cause of Christ being blessed in these days, it has to begin in the place of prayer, private prayer, and God's people praying together. That's the story of revival. It's the place of prayer that God blesses to then move. That should really challenge us as individuals, challenge us as a church. How committed are you to the place of prayer? How committed are you to the, the prayer meeting? How committed are you to that private place in your own home? Look at this decline. Look at the decline of the church. Look at your friends, your family, your neighbours are going to hell. Are you not concerned? Pray. Commit this to the Lord. Nehemiah was, would be a man greatly used. And it began in the place of prayer. Amen.